Well, all right, folks, let's do this. My name is David Parsons, and you are listening to Nostalgia Trap, and I thank you for doing so. Today, we're getting back to some bread and butter Nostalgia Trap type content where I talk with someone who wrote a book for a university press. And that's sort of like where I started out doing these episodes. If you go back almost 10 years now, uh, I like to talk with people who've written books, uh, the best of the university presses, the stuff that catches my attention, often in the American history and American studies genre, although we branch off into different areas from time to time. But lately, I've been posting a lot of stuff on the Nostalgia Trap Patreon, and I want to urge you to check it out. You can subscribe. Uh, You don't have to subscribe to check out those episodes. I think there are many free options. I think there are even options to buy individual episodes behind that paywall if you don't want to get into the whole subscription thing. But either way, you know, I like to provide a little something for the people that are actually putting in their debit card number and contributing to Nostalgia Trap, which is kind of an incredible thing, and I thank you for doing that. I want to sort of not just say it supports the podcast. I want to give something back. And so what I'm doing with these News Trap episodes is as many times a week as I can, I get behind this microphone and read off some excerpts from the mainstream media. I would say mostly from... The Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, other such sources. Often these are excerpts sent to me and curated by my co host on this program and good friend Justin Rogers Cooper. And I think of these news trap episodes as just sort of a way to record and mark uh, some things that you might have missed in the overall media swamp that we are all. Uh, rowing our little boats through every day. I like to stop and sort of point out a couple things that are either on the horizon or happening now. So if you've been enjoying those episodes or you want to check those out, I really appreciate you contributing to the Patreon and you can do all of that at the link in the episode description. So let's get to the main course of this episode. Today, I am talking with Andrew McKevitt. He is a professor of history at Louisiana Tech University, the author of a couple books about consumer culture, the latest of which is called Gun Country, Gun Capitalism, Culture, and Control in Cold War America. And we have a lot of fun in this conversation talking about the history of guns, the culture of guns, And a lot of connections to the Cold War that might surprise you. So this was a really fun episode to record. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for being a Nostalgia Trap listener. And enjoy this conversation with me and Andrew McKevitt. All right, let's talk about guns. How are you, Andrew McKevitt? Good to see you. Hi, David. Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, Yeah, of course. I feel like um, you are a natural nostalgia trap guest in a lot of ways. Uh, I want to say the name of your your latest book uh, because it it cuts to the core of uh, a lot of the things we try to get to on the show in terms of American violence and political economy. Um, But your book is called Gun Country. Gun, Capitalism, Culture, and Control in Cold War America. I was thinking those are like the three C's right there, like capitalism, yeah, that's, culture, and control. Right? That's that's really good alliteration, too. I'm, I'm proud of that alliteration. There's four hard C's in there. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, like, was that the CCC from the, from the New Deal? It was like capitalism, culture, and control, right? It's like the alternative <laughs> that's right. CCC. That's right. Um, but yeah, I, your book caught my attention because it's got an awesome cover and and the, su- and the subject matter is just so, so good. But um, I saw it on the U- University of North Carolina Press website where I find a lot of guests for this show because for whatever reason, that press does a lot of this kind of like intersection of like culture and political economy stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Including your own book, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Yeah. Uh, on coffee houses, which I, I I guess is, yeah, consumer culture. Which, by the way, has one of the all-time great 
titles, right? Dangerous, Dangerous grounds. grounds. I mean, that, that I just, I remember, I remember back because that came out what maybe two, three years ago, four years ago. Yeah. I remember I was, I was thinking of a title for this book, and that was one I was like, damn, that that just nailed it. Perfect, multiple meanings in there. I and couldn't, it's got I couldn't a, get like there. a dad joke in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's just like the, the pun. It's like, important. Get, to it, have dad get it? Grounds coffee, but also like other things. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Gun Country is a book that uh, it, it has a particular thesis about guns. And that's what I appreciate about it, because I've been thinking, I mean, I think all of us have been thinking about guns our whole lives, right? Because it's like, we live in an era of just gruesome gun violence. And a kind of like, I don't know, stagnant public discourse. Is that accurate to say? Yeah. Like it just seems like yeah, same, absolutely, yeah, for sure. You know, and and I think it's a generational thing too. In fact, I was just this morning. There's an article on Tim Walsh in um, the New York Times on his kind of uh, transformation in terms of gun politics, right? And so he's he um, he was one of those few Democrats years ago who still got money from the NRA and he had an A rating from the NRA. And then after 2018, that A rating fell off in part because he, when he ran for governor, he adopted a bunch of positions typically associated with kind of mainstream liberal gun control. And, you know, for him, what sort of buried in the article, his transformation came from his daughter, right? Who at the time was, I don't know, maybe 18 years old herself. So she's of that generation that grew up terrified of guns in public spaces all the time. That is that kind of Columbine generation, right? Like they've, they never knew a life in school that did not mean, uh, you know, shooting mass shooter drills and things like that. Whereas, yeah. you know, I, I didn't have anything like that. I was in college when Columbine happened. So, uh, it's a generational thing too, that I think is, is maybe starting to push the needle on, uh, our stagnant gun, uh, conversation or, or gun discourse, but I think in a lot of ways that discourse still sounds like it did back in the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what I think piqued my interest about your book is sort of tracing this back uh, to the Cold War era and and sort of understanding where guns come from there. Because I mean, just reading your introduction and sort of framing the uh, um, the the story that you're telling. The one thing that struck me is how you're, you know, pushing back against this sort of like frontier mythology, right? And like so often I'm like, I'm sitting here like looking at my like Richard Slotkin books and like, right. the, you know, being like, oh, this is obviously like uh, settler colonialism. You know, this is, you know, that kind of thing. And not that those things aren't part of the story. Um, but how does your story sort of periodize gun culture for us? Because it feels like it's coming out of the 50s and 60s and like the post-World War II stuff, which I love. Yeah, so so I I wouldn't argue that nothing like gun culture existed before 1945, right? So the book more or less starts chronologically in 1945, but uh, something like gun culture existed in the United States undoubtedly back to the maybe even the 17th century, and and of course it emerges out of the 18th century with the Revolutionary Era, and then we get the things that Slotkin's interested in, not just the frontier itself, but the myth making about the frontier, right? So in many ways he's writing about kind of the late 19th and early 20th century and the ways that pop culture really invents the frontier mythology. Uh, and so to me, gun culture is like all kinds of culture. It's something that changes over time. And I'm interested in the way it changes after 1945. And so before 1945, arguably, it is something oriented towards, uh, particularly on the kind of consuming end, on the demand end for guns. It's oriented towards hunting. It's oriented towards sports shooting. Uh, but after 1945, it gets oriented, it becomes much more heavily influenced by the major post-war consumer trends and broader American consumerism more generally. Um, I mean, the book starts with uh, some numbers, right? So if we start in 1945 and look at how many guns we have in the United States in 1945, Best guess, maybe 45 million. This comes out of a, a lot of research that a, a, a Johnson, a Lyndon Johnson era commission does on guns and gun history in the United States. Best guess, about 45 million guns in 1945. Here we are nearly 80 years later, and we're talking about at least 400 million guns, maybe 450 million guns. Again, we don't know because in part, we're not allowed to count guns. At least the federal government is not allowed by law to count guns. So we're talking about 80 years and growth in terms of 10 times as many guns, 1000% growth in the civilian stockpile of firearms in the United States. What makes that happen? It's not the frontier mythology, 
it's not the Second Amendment because those things are already there in the 18th, 19th and, and in the early 20th century. So what is responsible for that dramatic, incredible transformation in terms of the material reality of guns? Putting aside questions of law and constitutional rights, what explains that incredible material growth? It can't just be the Second Amendment because the Second Amendment's always there. What changes after the Second World War is the supply is the demand, is the way that guns are marketed, the way that they're distributed, the kinds of guns that get distributed, the way that they become cheaper and more accessible. And all of that, talking about all of that, to me, it was it meant it was sort of obvious. It means talking about capitalism. It means talking about consumerism and how guns actually get into people's hands when we when we look beyond kind of abstract notions of of law and rights. Mm. Um, so it sounds like the birth of like a gun industry that is is selling guns in a more accelerated way in the post World War II era. Is that right? That there's sort of like, and part of me, part of me, and is thinking also sort of like, do they work the same way as other consumer corporations work in the sense that they recognize it, a need in in a market and they sort of try to amplify that? Um, because uh, we live in the era of like the AR-15 and the sort of like right. Like, you know, some of these things go viral where the ads are just so crass and insane. I remember the one that was like, get your man card. Like, with yeah, the, in with, fact, with that's the that's the one that Remington <laughs> got sued for and lost seventy three million dollars because of that very precise ad. Right. Because the the Sandy Hook families that sued Remington or Bushmaster, yes, the, yes. the company that ends up buying Bushmaster, that's the advertisement they used and said this is they are advertising violence to young men uh, and and they won on that case. So so if we think about the history of gun capitalism, because, again, I, I don't want to claim that anything like like gun capitalism didn't exist before 1945. Gun capitalism is not new in 1945. It goes back at least to the middle of the 19th century and a number of kind of industrial innovators in the middle of the 19th century who create industrial or who create gun capitalism. We've got the, you know, the Sam Colts and the Remingtons and Winchesters and Brownings, all these kind of central figures of the middle of the century who are both uh, you know, depending on who it is, they're tinkerers, they're inventors, but they're also savvy marketers. And in some ways, they kind of create the gun industry as a marketing industry, as much as it is something to sell people tools that they can use for the various tasks they need to accomplish. What happens after 1945 is that the incredible growth of the American economy, the rapid supercharging of the con economy after World War II, the rapid growth of consumerism opens up a market for lots more Americans to buy guns. And the people who step in to provide those guns, they're not the Colts and Remingtons and Winchesters. In fact, they kind of miss the market in this regard. They don't see it. The people who see it are these kind of wily entrepreneurs I write about in the first couple chapters of the book, these kind of gun entrepreneurs who figure out that there's a vast demand here for uh, greater consumer access to firearms. Where are they going to get the firearms? Because these people are not, by and large, themselves manufacturers or the very low scale manufacturers. They find these guns in World War II Europe. This is where the first big sort of supply of cheap firearms is going to come into the United States after the Second World War. The iconic figure I write about here, his name is Sam Cummings. He's uh, he's born in the May, uh, mainline Philadelphia. His, his kind of a wealthy family and they lose all their money in the depression. And as a young kid, he becomes kind of a tinkerer himself. He, he, he would tell stories about like, taking apart a World War I era machine gun when he was five or six years old and reassembling it. It was sitting out on the VFW lawn or whatever. And um, uh, so he's going to become the first kind of central or the most important gun capitalist of this era of kind of the 1950s and 1960s. Cummings, by the end of the 1950s, and he would be very young, he wouldn't even be 30 years old by this point. By the end of the 1950s, he is the world's largest private arms dealer. And he gets that recognition because he's the one who has gone over to Europe, who has inspected all of these leftover guns left over from the war because – 
European countries aren't distributing this stuff, right? The Italian government and the West German government and the French government and the UK government and all governments in, in Scandinavia, they're not going around handing out leftover guns. There's millions of them. They don't want their populations to have them. There's no great demand among their populations. There's also increasingly laws that prevent their populations from owning um, firearms. And so they're just sitting there in warehouses and coming sees that opportunity there. There's all these stories he tells about he was in college himself. Uh, he went to George Washington University and he goes over to Europe in 48 or 49, sometime around there. And he talks about like seeing battlefields where like brand new tanks are still just sitting there waiting for somebody. He said he, he says like they still have Hitler's fingerprints on them mm. and they're like ready for somebody to grab these things and find a market for them. And he's the guy who's going to do that in the 1950s. And so he said he creates this company called Interarms. And Inter Arms is going to sell in the 50s and 60s, I don't know, best guess, anywhere from six to eight million firearms to American consumers. Cummings gets a reputation as sort of this like international man of mystery. He's selling like fighter jets and big weapon systems to Cold War allies and things like that. But he makes most of his money just selling cheap guns to Americans. He will go to a country like, you know, I talk about in Finland, he walks into the defense ministry, throws down a suitcase full of cash and says, how many guns will you give me? And they're happy to get rid of them. In some cases, they're getting rid of World War II era rifles. Many of these are like Mausers. Uh, the Carcano becomes infamous. That's an Italian design. These are bolt action World War II rifles. Um, he's selling, he's buying them for less than a dollar each. Wow. Uh, and he's he sets up a whole kind of logistics network to clean them up to the phrase he uses is sporterize them. So he think he's the one who comes up with this notion that we talk about today of the modern sporting rifle. Mm. He's taking World War II era guns and turning them into quote unquote modern sporting rifles. Uh, and uh, he'll sporterize them and he ships them over to the United States. He builds a, an incredible network in, in Europe to, to do all of this. He's got agents in every capital in Europe ready to buy up guns and ship them to his warehouses in Alexandria. Where, you know, at his peak, he's got something like half a million rifles just sitting in crates. You know, he tells Congress this at one point. He's like, 12 miles south of here, I've got half a million guns sitting in a warehouse. <laughs> I, could, I could supply four armies right at the drop of a hat. And Congress is looking at him like, we, we had no idea that this is what was going on. But this is how he gets incredibly rich, selling Americans really cheap guns. So if you open up a gun magazine from the 50s and 60s, chances are you'll see one of Sam Cummings' ads. Um, it, it's usually under the name Hunter's Lodge. And you can look through it. You, you'll see. I mean, it's just he would pack the ads with is guns. Is it all right? and ordering, was, like mail order stuff? It's yeah, not, it's all it's, mail order I'm stuff. I'm thinking about right? like uh, gun stores and gun shows as like the place where now I would think to go get a gun. Whereas yeah, uh, oh, so, so there's, there's two different magazine. things, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Cummings is selling guns through the mail, through his own retail front. But his bigger business is distributing guns to thousands of retailers across okay, the country, yeah. some of whom are selling them through the mail, some of whom are selling them, you know, locally. I mean, he's he like even Sears is one of Sam Cummings clients, right? You could go to Sears and buy a gun that Sam Cummings took from the Italian government uh, in, at some point in the 1950s. Um, and so these guns are just incredibly cheap. You know, if you walked into a gun store in uh, you know, 1960, and you wanted to buy a brand new, nice hunting rifle from a company like Remington or Winchester or whatever, you're probably looking at a minimum a hundred bucks, maybe 150 with the bells and whistles as much as 200, something like that, right? The equivalent of a couple thousand dollars today. You could get one of Sam Cummings used, uh, uh, beat up, but cleaned up World War II rifles for 10 bucks. Wow. Um, wow. And, you know, this becomes like a major sensation, a major scandal, really, in November 1963, when uh, Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly uh, uses. <laughs> oh, I love that we're still adding the allegedly. <laughs> you got you got to say like, because like, I'll look, get so many emails. He was not emails. convicted it's, in the court of law. So it's the only thing anyone ever emails me about is when I say something about about Oswald. Uh, he uses a, you know, he he spends twenty bucks because they they to um, get a, a a new scope on there and stuff like that. Twenty bucks orders through the mail a Carcano rifle that had been used manufactured in Italy in 1940 that had come through these networks. Cummings like later writes, he's like, thank God that wasn't one of mine. <laughs> he had he had gotten out. Of, he had actually gotten out of the Carcano business at that point. He thought he had found all the ones that were worth uh, selling. Um, but this is how 
he's one of the he's this kind of central figure in remaking gun capitalism after the Second World War uh, and turning it into this thing where cheap guns and the accumulation of guns in a market where they are seemingly limitlessly available uh, comes to define gun culture at that particular moment and gun capitalism. And I have a couple of different questions, but I think they, they sort of center on the idea of like, you know, what makes America unique here? Because uh, on the one hand, I'm like sort of like, well, OK, there's a surplus of guns after World War Two globally. I mean, a lot in Europe, it sounds like. Are there other countries that are there where there are crafty capitalists who are sort of, you know, creating this industry? And the other part of it goes to your bigger question, which is sort of like, why are Americans so fucking crazy for guns? Like what what is <laughs> happening right. there? Because especially in this era. <laughs> I don't know. You think about like different eras, like the the eighties. There's hysteria about crime and things like that. But this is like the late forties and into the fifties. So why is that culture? I'm like I'm thinking about home ownership and suburbs, the suburbs as one guess. But like there's, yeah. I mean, you you mentioned Richard Hofstetter. There are many who have tried to like get to like the kind of like spooky center of this question, which is just like what's with the guns? Like why? Right. Why all of a sudden do we need because? Uh, and I, I want to read this quote from uh, from your book at some point, but it gets to the idea that like there we don't need that these many like this is like kind of kind of insane that we're we have right. there's so many guns <laughs> right. uh, and most people aren't shooting them. They're just kind of like um, leaving them around the house or, you know, coveting them, fetishing. Most people aren't using them in crimes. That part of it is kind of confounding. Right, right. Like how how many guns do you need? Right. Like how many guns how many guns do you need to do whatever it is you need to do with guns? But that's if you're thinking about guns as a kind of tool, right? That that accomplishes some purpose for you, whether that purpose is hunting or like, you know, keeping varmints off They're your They're killing rural machines, property, man. Whatever. Just say it. Well, but that's a they are undoubtedly killing machines, but they're also collectors' items, right? Yeah, they are right. They're Pokemon and they're Beanie Babies and they're, well, you know, me, they're Let me version. read this quote because this is the one that popped <laughs> off for me. This was so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is from uh, Drew McKevitt's book, A Gun Country. Um, Guns then are common consumer goods, not unlike cars, refrigerators, and skateboards. While pathologizing guns has led to better understandings of their impact on public health, it has also made them more difficult to understand as objects of consumer desire. After all, only a tiny fraction of guns in the United States is used in a crime each year. People by and large do not buy guns, especially from licensed dealers, with the intention of using them in crimes. Instead, they often see guns not unlike how they see other consumer goods as objects of desire that hold out the promise of making buyers into the people they dream they might become. Sociologist Colin Campbell has written about consumers as daydreamers who imagine the products they buy as offering the possibility of personal transformation. Of course, fulfillment is ultimately ephemeral, so we look to the fancier car, the bigger house, or the newest assault rifle accessories to continue chasing that elusive daydream of remaking the self through consumption. I thought that was a, a really clever, uh, clever piece. Do you agree with that? Just brilliant. <laughs> I, I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, that 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 observation comes out of um, spending a long time thinking about consumerism. Right. So this is this is actually my second book on consumerism. The first one uh, was about uh, U.S. Japan relations in the 70s and the 80s. And I've, I've long been influenced by people like Colin Campbell, but lots of other sociologists, even historians like um, Larry Glickman and, and lots of others who've written about consumerism. Um, who've who've asked us to rethink those kind of uh, those those almost sort of like Frankfurt School notions of consumerism that we inherited that people are just like these empty vessels to be manipulated by mass media by the companies that want to sell us things um, and so in some ways I I wanted this to be a more empathetic um, uh, take a more empathetic approach to to understanding people who buy guns. Um, that, you know, that's not necessarily to say I, I want to be empathetic to the gun culture that has emerged in the 21st century. Like, as you've said, this culture that's centered around the AR-15, that promotes insurrectionism, that promotes social violence. Um, but that's not the gun culture of the 1950s. Um, you know, the, 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 the book cover is kind of uh, sort of sneaky in that way when we were talking about what it would look like. Because a lot of, um, a lot of book covers for guns, they're very sort of dark and they're they're sort of uh you know they they want to present like a sense of like menace and um you know i i wanted 
what I wanted to come across in the book cover was like, this is actually an era in the 1950s and 1960s. If you were a gun seller and a gun buyer, this is the golden age for you. Mm -hmm. And you don't in your mind associate guns with the conversations that come later out of gun control, out of the gun control movement, out of widespread gun violence. Not that it wasn't there in the 1950s, but it wasn't the center of the conversation. The center of the conversation was, or what drove the conversation was, this is an incredible bounty that we have here. The world, ha this is our reward for winning the second world war. In fact, Sam Cummings uses that language sometimes almost quite explicitly in his advertisements. Like I've gone around the world to the places that you, the American GI, conquered. And I'm bringing back the world's bounty of guns for you because you deserve those guns. And, and this is really, I guess, to circle back to your your first, the first part of the question, uh, you live in the only country that allows you to do this sort of thing because uh, America is the gun country. It has always been the gun country. It was a country founded on, on guns against a tyrant. And uh, we have these, you know, he's as well aware of these legacies of the 19th century of the frontier mythology and so forth as anyone else. This is part of your mythology, you American man in in the 1950s. And uh, these guns are your reward for for being the number one country, for being the country that defeated fascism that is now taking on communism, which itself is a kind of important point. Um, and, you know, the, the 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 material reality is like, no, there was no other country where this kind of thing could have happened uh, either for economic reasons. There's no other country that meet that has a consumer market like the United States does in the 1950s. Right. In 1945, 50 percent of all world productivity is in the United States. So by the 1950s, no consumer market anywhere in the world comes even within a, a magnitude of the United States. Right. And secondly, most countries around the world actually have laws restricting civilian gun ownership, or they're writing them in the 1950s and the 1960s. There's this really fascinating moment in 1968. 68 is such a um, fulcrum year in so many ways, and it ends up being true for guns as well, that, uh, you know, the Eisenhower, um, sorry, uh, uh, Johnson appoints this commission. It comes to be called the Eisenhower Commission. It's led by uh, Milton Eisenhower, the Dwight Eisenhower's brother. Um, and the the Eisenhower Commission is trying to gather as much data about guns and gun violence and gun ownership, not just in the United States, but around the world. And what they're quickly realizing is like, we don't know anything. We Nobody knows anything about guns. Here we are, a country that for almost 200 years, it's seen itself as the gun country and nobody knows anything. Sociologists, criminologists are only beginning in the 1960s to have real conversations about this stuff and nobody has any data. So it's kind of remarkable. What they do is they send they send telegrams out to all of the embassies around the world, uh, basically asking for the most basic of gun information, information that you would assume like, you know, somebody at the Library of Congress would be able to put together or something like that. But nobody can. Nobody has this basic data about gun laws around the world. And so th this is in the aftermath of, of King's killing in April of 1968, Bobby Kennedy's killing in, in June of 1968. And so in, in the second half of 1968, they're getting all these telegrams back from all over the world, some of which are many pages outlining gun laws in various countries, gun ownership rates, gun violence rates. And what they're discovering is that the United States is pretty unique. It's hard to find a country anywhere in the world. And it's not just the quote unquote civilized countries, because this was often part of the language in the 1960s. If the United States wants to be a civilized country, it has to get rid of gun violence. Well, a lot of countries they would have considered uncivilized that were, uh, you know, these they, they would have understood as third world countries, whatever, they also had more restrictive gun laws than the United States. There's this kind of funny line in, in one of them where they're like, the only place we could find the equivalent of, of like Texas was in like the mountains of Afghanistan where like ma manhood <laughs> is defined by gun ownership and like you fire off your gun to celebrate things. It's like, it's like Texas and Afghanistan. That's wow. like, th that is the closest analog they could find to, to this kind of gun, gun culture. And of course they have their own sort of liberal assumptions about how the world should work and, you know, what role guns, if any, should have in a society. But it's just incredible how they're only learning at this moment, how little they knew and how different the United States was from the rest of the world. Yeah, that God, what an incredible kind of comparison to like <laughs> so so of those worlds. And it makes me think about like I don't know the consumer end of this. Um, it, it, you know, there's it's you know there's the Second Amendment and the kind of like 
idea of this kind of God given or founding fathers given constitutional right. But it seems like, and I, I think this is where your book um, sort of gets to, brings us to the 21st century in some way. And like, people care more about like their consumer rights than their constitutional rights. Like that, that's, that's a discourse that's been, I feel like among historians for a while. Like I'm looking at the, I'm looking at uh, Elizabeth Cohen's book over here, consumers Republic, mm -hmm. right. In which she's like, just totally about like this post, the specific post-war era in which the like citizen becomes constructed as a consumer. So like that part of it just makes it seem like gun control. And I know this is, a, this is something that uh, is a point in your book. And I wanted to ask you about it. It's sort of like how does gun control sort of become consumer control? Because it's sort of like that's that's what we're talking about here. It's sort of like putting limits, and like Americans often respond to limits on their consumer rights uh, in ways that are some, some somehow stronger than their uh, than their opposition to limits on constitutional rights. If that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's a really interesting way to put it. Um, you know, so one of the, I mean, one of the, um, the Liz Cohen book has always been very influential uh, in in my work as well. And you know, one of the things she talks about is the citizen consumer, right? Yeah. And so I, I, I tried to trace the 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 citizen soldier becoming the the citizen consumer of of guns, right, or the that's consumer great. soldier, yeah. or something, Love it. or something like that, right? And a lot of that happens, I think, in this post war era, right? And so if we think about how especially the gun rights groups on the far right in the 1960s and this isn't even talking about the NRA this is talking about guns to or gun rights groups to the right of the NRA kind of small local groups that are just kind of popping up in the 1960s because it's it's after Kennedy's assassination that we get these first like major national conversations like what do we do about these guns we got too many guns what do we do about it um, and and as we as we creep up to 1968, when we're going to get the Gun Control Act of 1968, the first major federal gun legislation in a generation back to the, the New Deal, when we go, creep up to 1968, we see emerging on the far right all of these new groups that are saying like, one, they don't trust the NRA because the NRA is in there in those congressional hearings and it's negotiating with politicians with uh, Senator Tom Dodd is the really the key figure here that's negotiating with Dodd's committee all the time about acceptable limitations on gun rights. And these groups are saying there are no acceptable limitations on gun rights. And that is because we are citizen soldiers. That is our obligation. We have a duty to defend this country. Of course, what they think they're, they need to defend their country from is communists and they think those communists are in the federal government. They think Dwight Eisenhower is a communist. They think the Soviet Union is going to invade and they need to barricade themselves, lock themselves up or hide themselves off in the mountains of wherever and get ready to go to some sort of apocalyptic war. But they did have this understanding of the Second Amendment as a duty and an obligation tied to a right. And that understanding of the Second Amendment is the closest that anyone has in this post-war era to what, according to historians, not so much the legal scholars who write, you know, the Heller decision or the Bruin decision, but according to historians, that's about as close to a consensus as you might find coming out of the founders. Mm -hmm. The idea that this was, it's a um, uh, uh, historian at Fordham named Saul Cornell. He writes a great book about almost 20 years ago now called A Well-Regulated Militia. I think it's the best study of by a, a historian of the 18th century of the founders and their ideas about the Second Amendment and what it meant. And, you know, the first thing he says is like there's there was no consensus. But if there's a, a broad understanding of what the Second Amendment was supposed to be, he said it, he called it a civic right, which is to say it's a it's a right tied to a duty or an obligation <clears throat> to help defend the country against external and internal enemies. And the radical gun rights groups of the 1960s actually have this understanding of the Second Amendment. But so it's, not a hyper, it's not a hyper individualized uh, sort of uh, construction no, that, of owning guns. Yeah, exactly. They And what gets lost in the radicalization of the broader gun rights movement in the last 50 years is that notion of collective defense, that collective duty to defend the community. And instead, what we pull out of the 1960s is that consumer oriented thing, that I have a right mm. to access an unlimited market, which itself can't be restricted by government. Um, and that's what comes to define gun culture, right? I mean, so many of our 
fights about what we do about guns, they take place on this field of commerce, right? There were who can buy, when can they buy it, where can they buy it, who can sell it. The Second Amendment doesn't say anything about those things, right? The key verbs in the Second Amendment are keep and bear. We're not right. we're we're rarely ever arguing about keeping and bearing. We're arguing about producing and distributing and marketing and buying and selling and those kinds of things. So so much of our our gun debate and our gun politics takes place in the field of commerce, when in reality, that's not the world of the Second Amendment, because there were no large manufacturers of firearms in the 1890s, except for government, or sorry, the 1790s, except for governments. Uh, we didn't get anything like industrial scale gun manufacturing in the United States until the 1830s, the 1840s. Um, and so uh, that that Second Amendment has, of course, you know, uh, every historian would say, and and even kind of liberal politics today say that the, the far right has distorted the Second Amendment. They made it about this kind of individual right when it used to be about the militias and so on and so forth, uh, which is all true. But I think we the, the important change has been in the way that consumer capitalism taught the individual about their right to access an unlimited market. And we're always yeah. arguing about access to that market. Um, you know, again, I think I think if 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 we're going to talk about restrictions, I don't I don't think we should be talking about restrictions on individuals. I don't think we should stigmatize individuals. I don't think we should uh, punish individuals. I think we should go after those things that didn't exist in the 1790s. It wasn't individual gun owners. It was large multinational corporations that profit incredibly off of the sale of these things. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like as the i don't know the era of like school shootings and ma mass public violence in the last 20 30 years ha there have been like particular like moments of activism like certain school shootings the one in florida as i recall was the one that right parkland the, 2018 yeah right reduce this big movement it seems like there there is a sort of like um, I don't know, is there a, sophi a, a sophistication, more sophistication in recognizing gun capitalism as an issue? Is that true? And, or, or is it still the same kind of moralizing and the same kind of ideas over and over? Because it seems like that moment passed, whatever that moment was, it reached its limits. And it seems like that, that cycle just keeps happening, right? Where there's outrage, we got to do something. Right. And then we all go, oh, I guess we can't do anything. And it seems like the other end of it, like right. the people that are really defending gun rights are like, you know, it's sort of like the price we pay is just mm -hmm. like in in mass shootings. Like we just mm -hmm. because, you know, anyone can go buy a gun and that's what we have to protect. And that part. of Yeah, it quite, quite literally the line from from yeah. NRA President uh, Harlan Carter way back in 1975 testifying before a committee when when some congressman asked him something to that effect, like, you know, any, you know, the way they'd phrase it, the language of the time, any crazy person can walk into a gun store and buy a gun as long as they don't have a criminal record and they go out and shoot anyone they want. And, you know, what do you think about that? And he said, this is the price we pay for freedom. And that continues to be the line that the NRA uses in the aftermath of all of these these mass shootings. And they'll you know they'll be quiet for a while. They learned like you just don't say anything for five or seven days, and you wait for that cycle to kick up, and then you can reemerge and say we're here to defend the the law abiding citizen, right? That's this construct of the law abiding citizen. This myth of the law abiding citizen is always since the 1930s has driven the way that the NRA has approached um uh approached gun politics but you're right that you know in the last 20 or 30 years so to again like think about how this is a problem of political economy so yeah. so in, in 1994 right congress passes the assault weapons ban mm -hmm. um and it outlaws a whole range of more or less kind of cosmetic features of various rifles that that are visibly identifiable as kind of military style rifles, right? So the AR-15 is in there. And what gun companies do is they they quickly figure out ways to get around those things. They'll they actually create models that are like, you know, the A, I don't know, the whatever, the A B model, which means like after ban model, which means we took off the various features that would get this banned, but we're still selling the same gun. Um, but it did take off the market, the AK-47, at least like the American variant of it, the AR-15 and, and any very lots of similar other rifles. That expires in 2004. 
Uh, it's going to expire because it's set. It's it has a sunset for of ten years. We've got George W. Bush in the presidency in two thousand four. At least one house, if not both, are controlled by Republicans in, in two thousand four. It's not going to pass again. So that expires, and that expires at a moment when the United States is fighting various imperial wars on the other side of the planet. Where on our televisions every day on Fox News and CNN, we can see U.S. soldiers carrying the very same rifle that I can go out to the store now and purchase the AR-15 or other variants of it. The one single difference being that the the M-16, which is the military version of the AR-15, it has uh, burst fire, meaning a three round burst or automatic fire and that you can't get that model in the United States. But everything else is exactly the same when it comes to uh, the, M the M16 and, and an AR-15 in terms of what you're able to buy. And so Americans are, are American gun enthusiasts now know that market is open and I can go buy those guns that the United States is using to defend freedom around the world. Um, also thinking about political economy, 2005, Congress passes a law. It's called uh, the acronym is PLACA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. And what it essentially does is it prevents anyone from suing a gun company for their guns doing what their guns are supposed to do, right? Guns are designed to kill. They're designed to wound and to kill even handguns especially are designed to wound and kill human beings. Handguns are not hunting weapons. They are by and large defensive weapons for human beings. Uh, so you can no longer sue a gun company after 2005 for its gun doing what the gun was supposed to do. You could sue the company if like you buy a handgun and you're out at the range and it explodes in your hand because then the, gun, the company was negligible and made gave you a, a product that didn't work. But you can't sue them when those guns are out on the streets and you're killing people because there were a whole bunch of cities in the 1990s that were starting to come together to sue gun makers for flooding their markets with uh with firearms reminds and reminds me of like to... suing tobacco companies and yes like that was very companies. much right. that was very much the model too and um, um uh, silicon valley too i mean so the section 230 i think of the telecommunications act same year, right 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 that protects um the the basically web companies and and internet platforms and social media companies from any of the harm done by the people that use their platforms to you know uh sell drugs that kill people sell guns that kill people uh live stream murders they're mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm. exempt from prosecution for all of that and it seems like god it's just written into the structure of capitalism and the the, the legal structures that they can like put out a product that is absolutely fucking insanely dangerous and then step back insulate themselves from any legal liability and collect the money and that is fucking maddening um and the fact that it's like yeah it's guns it's it's phones dude like we know that phones melt kids minds like we shouldn't right. be giving them this shit um and yet there is a kind of like well what you're gonna tell me i can't buy a phone for my kid you're gonna tell right. me i can't fill my house with fucking guns and like yeah that's that's the mindset. I don't see it going anywhere. I get. I mean, I don't want to be cynical about it, but it just seems like that's fucking America, man. No, I. Uh, hey, look, the first draft of this book, <laughs> I got, <laughs> I got, I got one of the reviewers is like, "This is great, but this is really cynical. We need, yeah. we need some, we need some, we need like a rainbow at the end of the, you know, road or whatever." Well, it's, and, you mentioned um, those dark covers of the book. It's cynical, and it's, it's, I don't want maybe cynical is the wrong word because like there is the kind of like hand wringing gun control shit that like right, the, right. I, I think you're re referencing those sort of like I don't know very squarely culturally liberal books that are like mm -hmm. wringing their hands about guns. Uh, when there's sort of like a more like realistic look at like where guns come from, why they are the way they are, but they are, they do seem like a magical object for people. Yeah. And for both, for both gun owners and, or at least gun rights activists, because I think there's plenty of gun owners who just don't think about this shit at all, but for gun rights activists and for gun control activists, right? I think they both think about these as kind of magical objects uh, in certain ways for the gun rights movement. They they're the thing that connects you back to the Minutemen themselves. You are part of this long history and tradition. Of course, they you know, they ignore all like empirical evidence as to the danger of a firearm in the home and instead assume that they'll be the one person who will confront you know, the, I don't know, the assassins at the door who are going to come storming into their home one day, they're going to pull out the their AR-15 and and do some John Wick shit or something like yeah. that. Um, God, also John, too, John I think, Wick um, the, the, is, a, is like the <laughs> ultimate kind of symbol. Like to me, it's just like this movie is 
like a porno about a gun ultimately yes yeah i think that's right although you know i think yeah sometimes somebody's made that comparison recently that like the the gun rights types today like all see themselves as john wick but john wick kept so this is going way off on like a cultural studies tangent but john wick kept some of like you know it's sort of a transition from like john wayne to john wick i wanted to write this article john wayne from to john wayne wick. to wick i hear the, from wayne uh, to wick. the american it, studies panel on this yeah that's right uh, that's right but you know john wick is still not a fucking crybaby like most of these people on the right are like right. when you talk about like they're restricting their rights to access a consumer market or something like that it's just whining it's grievance you know there is no there's no strong and quiet type anymore they're they're much more loud about what they want access to that they want unrestricted right don't tell me i can't buy phones for all of my children don't tell me i can't buy guns don't tell me i can't buy the f-350 that you know takes up lanes and murders people like don't tell me i can't uh, buy all these things. They're not the strong and, and silent type. And so maybe John Wick is not um, the best comparison. <laughs> I'm thinking about like Tommy Lee Jones in No Country for Old Men, right? Uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. If they, well, if, I think, you know, he's modeling himself on that kind of John Wayne. Yeah, but if, the, if you remember the beginning of that movie, he talks about like the, the old guys in Texas, the old sheriffs, the original mm. guys, they didn't even have guns. They didn't even carry guns. They, they didn't, That's right. believe, they That's didn't right. believe in it. They came in and they sort of like, you know, talk the situation out. And it's sort of like, I don't know that that kind of like, I, I think you're locating, like there is a desire for a balanced figure of masculinity. That isn't just the like, you know, like the crass MAGA dude with his F-350 right. and his AR-15, like the kid rock kind of vision. There is, <laughs> the there kid. is a desire for a strong, quiet type. And, and I think that, yeah. that, that, you know, that sort of like the polarity of gun rights versus the gun that uh, control people doesn't really doesn't really make space for that kind of person right and mm -hmm. like that and I, I know that like gender has a lot to do with this um but it seems like I don't know when you say strong quiet type I'm I'm kind of like yeah well I, I think that there is an an American sort of image that's somewhere between that citizen soldier and consumer that people are aiming for would be the answer to this I don't know yeah I, that I mean that's you know we're we're who knows what's going to happen. But I, I think Tim Walls is such a great example of that, right? Like here's a guy who's like, he's hunted all of his life. He can tell you everything you want to know about a gun. He'll clean your gun. He'll fix it up. He'll go gun that shopping guy, with you. Yes, but that's like, who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. But like, he's not, he's not out there like yelling about, you know, he's not carrying the AR 15 around the state Capitol and, and yelling about, uh, you know, face masks or something. I don't know like why that. I'm expressing this desire for moderation and normalcy right now, but it seems <laughs> like it seems like it's in the zeitgeist, right? Like it seems <laughs> like there's kind of like a and we're way off tangent here, but it has to do with the gun shit, the hysteria is a sort of like it feels like there's a little bit of like shut the fuck up going on to like Joe Rogan types, anti-vax type. They're just I'm sick of hearing the fucking dumb conspiracy shit. And I don't want to be like the middle porridge liberal. But at the same time, yeah. I'm just kind of like there's so many people that need to shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we're 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 definitely we're on some kind of pendulum swing back away from away from those people. I don't I don't we're the, we're just too close to it right now to be able yeah, to explain it. That's true. And the fact that I mean I just think that it's funny that the fact that Democrats are calling the Republicans weird and it's working <laughs> is is really interesting, right? Because in another moment, you'd be like, "What the fuck's wrong with weird, man?" Like, right. weird's good. <laughs> and like now you're going to make weird the January 6th people are weird. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, getting back to the, the the gun thing, you know, what it makes me think about reading your stuff is um, the evolution. I read this book about called The Engines of Change, which is about um, the auto in American auto industry hmm. and what they mm -hmm. did with uh, the Jeep in the years after World War Two. Same deal, right? They had all these Jeeps and they didn't really know what to do with them. And over the years, they evolve into a consumer product. And it, like Jeeps now is just like a big you know, a, a big car company that you can go buy these Jeeps. But it, it took a while to sort of like find a way to sell military surplus item like Jeeps to like suburban dads. But now, as we mentioned, tons of people drive Jeeps, tons of people drive trucks, and they're not really like outdoorsmen. They're not really like military yeah, yeah, yeah. people. And I think it links up to your idea with the gun is that like, there's something like going on with cosplay in the years after World War mm -hmm. II, where none of us serve any historical purpose 
And so it's like, well, I, I, and you're like, your identity is entirely formed by the shit you buy. And you're sort of like, well, fuck, I'm a boring guy with a boring job. Nothing exciting will ever happen. But if I got a bunch of guns and like a Jeep and a big <laughs> truck, then I'm kind of like, that's okay. It makes it okay. I can imagine. That's my identity. The, the consumerism shapes my identity. The Jeep's such a good comparison. I've never thought about that before, too. Like, if you think about it also, like, think about what that World War II era Jeep looked like, right? Very sort of stripped down. It was almost like a carved piece of aluminum with a windshield. And then look <laughs> yes. at like, you know, what you drive up against it, like the super mega Jeep Wagoneer that's like has like 18 seats and takes up two mm -hmm. lanes. I mean, that's the equivalent of like the AR-15 compared to the rifles that Americans were buying back in the 1950s that had been used in the war. Right. Most of these are bolt action, meaning they're not semi-automatic like, you know, you buy an AR-15 today. It's like. You load the thing, you pull the trigger. Every time you pull the trigger, it's going to fire a rifle around until you run out of bullets. The With a bolt action rifle, you actually have to operate the bolt every time you you fire the thing. So it's not semi-automatic. Um, and so we, it felt like a very sort of compared to like the military rifles that people buy today. It was very sort of stripped down thing. But still, nevertheless, kind of in some ways, the equivalent of the AR-15 to back in, you know, the 1940s, right? Like that's that's what... Now it Lots has air conditioning and Bluetooth and all that <laughs> shit. Right. It's like, how tough are you, man? If your Jeep has air conditioning and Bluetooth, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I always wanted. I always wanted a Jeep when I was a teenager. We never gonna. We were never. But I wanted one of those. All I well, I like wanted to be that guy. Like, yeah, I got this old. See, down so thing why did I, you want it? It's like it, 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 there's a carnal desire. Masculinity. It was about masculinity. Yeah. I think you know. I, we grew up near the beach, and it's like the cool kids had Jeeps that they could drive on the beach and and shit like that. So. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's something we, that first generation, that buying generation, um, and we're, we're talking almost exclusively about men here. We're talking mostly about white men here. Um, many of them are, are veterans and these firearms help kind of commemorate that experience. Uh, one of those studies in the 1960s, one of those, those, um, commissions found that if you were, uh, a veteran of the Second World War, you were something like 110% more likely to own a firearm than someone who was not a veteran of the Second World War. Because you, you know, even if you weren't in combat, and most people weren't in combat, even if you weren't in combat, um, you still went through training, you got, com you became comfortable with firearms. And these firearms were a way to kind of commemorate that war experience, um, especially getting a firearm from like a, a an enemy country, right? Like a German Mauser, could you know that was part of that is a a kind of thing that commemorates that experience of you having served in the second world war uh and so that that war connection has always been there and i i, I think yeah. that's still part of that i mean if you look at the you go gun shopping or look at gun sale websites and all the accessories everything is in, intensely militarized right even the ar-15 itself or if you if you talk about like to gun executives who've kind of moved away from from the industry they say they were horrified by this 20 years ago that they were showing up at like the gun shows and the things starting to take over were what they called at the time the black rifles right because there's no wood on these things they don't look like a traditional hunting rifle many of them operate or have the similar kind of mechanisms or similar caliber or whatever but they they are they're intentionally designed for military use and a military aesthetic uh and this was horrifying them that this was what was taking over the industry and it's now the dominant part of the industry it's the most sold rifle in the country the estimates anywhere from 20 to 30 million ar-15 sold in the last 15 or or 20 years i think that's probably even on on the low end um probably something like 10 percent of all guns in the united states i think reasonably are ar-15s or ar-15 style guns right ar-15 is a, a trademark of the colt colts we corporation so you um, but there's millions of guns that are are just like AR-15s. They're just not called AR-15s. Um, but I, anyway, I'm I'm sort of going well, off. Well, when my, you hear those numbers, because I think that's one of the most striking things you start with in your book is sort of like how many fucking guns are in America? Just millions and millions and millions of guns. And it's sort of like I don't know the story. There, there's that. Um, the, I think it's like a, a cliche in like storytelling, like Chekhov's gun, or the idea that like right. <laughs> if, there, if you introduce a gun or a bomb to the story, like they got to use them. And I think a lot of people, and they, maybe this is a paranoid uh, people that are afraid of guns. They hear this, and people that don't own guns, and they're like, "Wow, there's hundreds of millions of guns in America." At one point, people are just going to all go crazy and pick them up, and we're just going to have total civil war on the street. And sort of like that fear seems like it's always there. And yet 
we that doesn't really happen. Instead, we have like these sort of like bursts of individual violence here and there. It's almost like the the split that you're talking about, that fracture in which it's like the the move from citizen soldier to uh, to citizen consumer really does sort of it, so hyper individualize and break that communal link with with uh, guns that have been embedded mm -hmm. in the Second Amendment that we can't possibly all get it together and like have a revolution because we all have guns kind of thing. There's, there's so many ironies layered into this. Yeah, right. Like, like who, where's the militia going to come from? Who's going to organize right. the militia? Right. And I mean, in the nineties, we had our militia mo movement or militia moment with yeah, the militia and movement. I mean, people argue it's happening now too. And I think there are militias yeah. obviously. Yeah. But you know, we, you, you talk about like the oath keepers, although a lot of them are in prison now or the three percenters, those types, like the scale that you would need to have a broad kind of social and, and political impact for that sort of thing is, is kind of inconceivable. Um, especially in the way that most people, I think, think about their guns, because you're right. Say there's 400 million guns in the country. Like, I don't know, 200 million of them are sitting in closets and people haven't touched them for a decade or, or more. Um, it's again, there were other studies that the, the newer a gun is, the more recently the gun has been purchased, the more likely it is to be used in a crime. Which makes sense, right? Because like once yeah. the gun goes in the closet, it just stays in the closet. It's never going to sort of come out. Uh, but that's especially the case for handguns. And, and you know, 70% or more of all gun violence every year is is uh, a product of handguns rather than than anything to do with these AR-15s and these rifles. And so the, the, the threat of something like the AR-15, it remains sort of amorphous and it's out there and you know it's it's always in the future right because we can't point to with the exception of very hyper localized incidents which themselves are don't even register on a macro scale we can't point to like an ar-15 violence problem we have mass shootings but you know mass shootings account for like on the whole maybe a couple hundred deaths every year out of 40 or 50,000 gun deaths, right? Most Which gun are deaths what? are suicides and homicides. Two thirds of, like of them are suicides. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then, you know, the, the other, the other bulk of it accounts for like, you know, street violence or gang violence, things like that. The kinds Domestic of things violence. that people don't give a fuck about, which is like, that's tough. exactly it. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, like ban the AR 15s. Great. You're going to, you're going to get rid of 200, gun deaths a year. You're not going to do anything about the gun violence a mile from my house, right? I hear I live in a city that is uh, one of the poorest cities in the country. And every night I hear pop, pop, pop going off somewhere a mile or two away. None of that's going to go away. If you get rid of the AR-15s, you're going, the AR-15 is again, for the gun control people, it's just as much a magical talisman as it is for the gun rights people uh, thinking that this is going to be the solution to all of our, our gun problems. Instead, I, it's, it's a culture war thing, right? Like we want to ban the AR-15 because we want to win that little piece of the culture war. Um, and, you know, I agree, like civilians don't need military style weapons, but I don't know in a macro sense what doing anything about them is going to do to the broader problems of gun violence in the United States, which is first and foremost, a suicide problem, right? Yeah. You, you need to take guns out of people's homes because people use guns to kill themselves. Uh, and then secondly, a kind of problem of poverty and lack of opportunity and, and lack of education and so forth. And those are things that are much harder for that neither political party wants to touch or do anything yeah. about like a healthier, in any real a hel sense. Uh, what you're saying, I think I might agree with it, is like the, a healthier society in general, however we yeah. kind of construct that, yeah. would be able to tolerate a lot of guns um, because there would yeah, be that's a, so it's many a good people question. wanting to kill themselves I, I, and so many right, men right. wanting to kill women and et cetera. Yeah. Right. You want you want to do like an experiment to see if you can reduce gun violence. Give us another new deal. Right. And see where that goes and and get rid of poverty and get rid of of, you know, the crime of opportunity and crime of desperation and then see what happens with the gun. like that. Let's try that. Experiment. We won't have to take anyone's guns away. Just <laughs> fund education I and love it. fund employment and you know a universal income. Let's try that and see what happens with gun violence. And then if it doesn't work, we could talk about you know, banning AR-15s or whatever. You can still do your else. cosplay. I mean, the, the number one That's selling vehicle, for I think for the last 12 <laughs> years at least, the number one selling vehicle in America is the F-150, right? And it's like- That's right. That's right. And most people are driving them to Trader Joe's. They're not driving them on off-road right. at all. <laughs> so it's the same thing as the guns, right? <laughs> it's like, I mean, I knew a guy that had two AR-15s under his bed. He's like, I have two AR-15s under my bed. And I'm like, why? He was like, I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's right. Like, right? who are you going to like? Sh- I, I could what buy do you do with that. What do you do? Yeah, it just seemed like a cool thing to have. And like, I think it's like you know. Yeah. I mean, it it is. You, I'll I'll be honest. It's fun to go to the range and fire a gun. That's a fun thing to do. It is as an activity. <laughs> I don't know if that's because I'm a, a man born in the United States, but that is a fun thing to do. But otherwise, what the fuck you need that thing for? Just go to the range and rent it from the the people who who own the gun range or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I get so. it. God, there's just there's so much great stuff in your book. I want to thank you, uh, Andrew McKevitt, for joining me. I want to say the name of your book again, uh, which is Gun Country, uh, Gun Capitalism, Culture and Control in Cold War America. Thanks for joining me. This is fun. Yeah, David, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. This was great. Thanks. Thank you. Well, all right, folks, I think that's going to wrap it up for Nostalgia Trap this week. I want to thank Andrew McKevitt for coming on the show and talking with me all about guns, a favorite subject. And go check out his book. It's called Gun Country, Gun Capitalism, Culture and Control in Cold War America, out right now from the University of North Carolina Press. And I want to thank you, the listener, for coming along the ride with me if you want to check out the rest of our stuff and listen to the news trap episodes i appreciate the support you can do that at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap link is in the episode description i have lots more of these interviews on the way so stay tuned and i hope you have a good week talk to you later bye bye <laughs>